Good afternoon. Um, let me welcome you to the seminar of, uh, with uh, Martin Janssen. Uh, Martin works uh, somewhere in Portugal, uh, Coimbra. lives in uh, Coimbra, uh, lives in Spain, and he's a developer of a system called TEI Talk. I, I don't know how it's pronounced, whether this way or -talk. we call it Tay Talk. Something. So um, he actually recently, about a month ago, had a seminar or two months at the Czech National Corpus about the system, and it intrigued us so much that we invited him later on uh, to talk uh, about uh, a possibility of setting up um, something based TI talk or, uh, or merging it with the current way we, we manage corpora here, because it seems that many features of the system are much more suited to corpora that are supposed to be used by other researchers than linguists. So there are many use cases in humanities that they require from literary computing to even sociology history that require working with large textual or maybe mostly textual corpora, but uh, not by linguists and not primarily for linguistic purposes. And uh, TayTalk seems to be very interesting uh, system for us. So we actually want to employ uh, Martin. Uh, we'll talk about it in an hour <laughs> uh, to to set up uh, to set up this system or kind of merge it with the way we manage corpora currently. So, uh, Martin, you have the floor. Okay. Um, so I'll give a, um, an explanation of TEDOK. TEDOK is a rather overly ambitious system. It does many many things. It actually does more than it can handle in a sense. It also does more than most of the users can handle. Um, so it has a lot of different aspects, and I'll today give sort of a cross between the perspective of a philologist and the perspective of a computational linguist. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about both, but mostly from the perspective of the, of the philologist, because that, in a sense, is where this system differs most from, uh, say, uh, Context or other uh, uh, corpus tools like CQP Web or Corpuscle or Black Lab. <coughs> So the starting point for TayTalk is very different. The starting point for TayTalk is basically this. Um, <coughs> this is a, a letter uh, written in 1599 by um, a normal person. That is to say, this isn't a scribe, it isn't a professional writer. This is just a normal person. It's in this case a merchant who is writing to the customs office about something. And uh, these are not literary texts. They are written on uh, a paper that normally goes away. So no normally these kind of papers will be thrown away. But in this particular case, uh, the merchant was uh, uh, put in prison, uh, I think actually in the, by the Inquisition. Um, and it is kept as part of a legal procedure. So there's all sorts of legal documents from lawyers. And those are, in a sense, not that interesting, in a sense. But this particular uh, text, which is written by a normal person, uh, is kept as part of the legal procedure. And it contains a wealth of information. Um, it is uh, the, uh, the corpus uh, that this comes from, uh, it's called Postscriptum. It's a corpus that is semi-Portuguese, and uh, half, half Portuguese and half uh, uh, Spanish. It's a European project that uh, terminated a while ago. Uh, and the idea is that this is as close as you can get to, say, oral texts from that period. It's people that don't really know how to write, so they write pretty phonetically. So this gives you an idea as to how people actually spoke. And it also gives you an idea as to how people actually used the language in that period. Because scribes and definitely legal texts, which we have loads of, don't contain the actual language of the time. They contain usually a much older the type of language that is sort of uh, <coughs> institutionalized, and it's, it's only a handful of scribes that you usually have text from. Whereas these really are text from uh, a lot of different people. Um, <coughs> and since they're handwritten, they contain errors, they contain self-corrections, they contain a lot of things. And all those kind of things give you even more information as to how people actually use the language. Because if they correct themselves, then it very often means that they wanted to say one thing and they said something else in, uh, afterwards. <coughs> but a lot of the information that makes this text so interesting is depending on the actual text in this letter. So we really want to describe this document. So this is really an historic document that we want to describe. Um, so I'm going to use this as an example. But the same holds for modern-day uh, learner texts. 
uh, all the, the corrections that students make for themselves have the same kind of uh, uh, properties. The, the, the actual thing that is written down is, is your, your core <coughs> source of information. So you want to keep as much as that as you, as you can. Now the traditional way of transcribing a text like this is more or less like this. So you describe the text that is hard to read, so you, you transcribe it so you can actually see it. You uh, choose between any of the many different ways in which you could do that. In this case, this is semi-paleographic. Uh, you indicate with square brackets uh, letters that weren't actually written but uh, uh, were supposed to be there, sort of abbreviations. Uh, you used uh, uh, dots or other symbols to indicate places where the text is not readable or disappeared, or God knows what. You use vertical lines to indicate where there's a line break. <coughs> and we have a lot of this, the, the, this kind of text. This is uh, the traditional field of uh, philology, the different uh, conventions, but it's more or less all a variation on the same theme. If you want to use this, then um, it has a number of, uh, of serious problems. And one of them is that all these codes that you use characters for uh, tend to not be used consistently. So you have an opening bracket and then forgot to put the closing bracket. Or you have somebody that actually wrote uh, uh, brackets in the text and you can't distinguish those from the brackets that are supposed to indicate uh, codes. <coughs> so if you want to use this for a computer, you have a big, big problem. You can't really use this as a, for a computer. Uh, for a human user, it's sort of uh, usable, but if you want to, to do anything computational with this, that doesn't really work. <coughs> so fortunately, we nowadays have TEI, which is a way of doing the same. It also comes more or less from the field of philology, and it allows you to say all those things, but then using actually proper language, uh, 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 XML markup language. <coughs> And there's all sorts of problems with TEI, but it is a proper way of actually describing. This is computer readable, this is something you can do things with. Uh, if you go to the website of, the, of Digital Humanities, then it says, or to the one of TEI, I can't remember. It says TEI is one of the biggest breakthroughs in Digital Humanities. It was one of the first things that really makes it possible to put uh, digital documents out there. So it allows you to do a lot of things that you couldn't do before. <coughs> I have to see where I see. Now, this is useful for a human user, despite the fact that he couldn't read this, but this we can then project in something else, in a, in a reader of TEI, so we can read this properly, and basically see the thing that we had before, but then actually generate it from the XML. <coughs> but if you really want to do something computational with this, if you want to study ancient language, then we need to use NLP techniques, and NLP doesn't like any codes. So if you use NLP techniques, then the very first thing you always do is take the TEI and clean out all the XML codes so that you have a plain text. Um, you then say, well, these kind of words are abbreviations and I don't actually have them in my lexicon, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to normalize the text. Right? We're not interested in what was actually written, we normalize it so that we can actually properly treat it. And then you have something that you can just run through a part of sheet stagger or uh, a, a, a linguistic analyzer, and you get your uh, a proper NLP kind of input where you can add uh, part of speech tags, lemmas, dependency relations, and whatever else you're interested in. <coughs> so this is something that has been done a lot. So they take transcriptions from the philological uh, domain, uh, clean them up, normalize them, run them through a part of speech tagger, and uh, you can do your linguistic analysis. <coughs> But we threw all the actual TEI codes away, which means that a lot of the information that made the text so interesting are no longer there. Furthermore, the text actually has been normalized in the meantime, so all the, the, uh, the orthographic errors that are making this text so interesting because it's semi-oral are no longer there. We now have a normalized text. It's not modern grammar, but it is modern orthography, right? <coughs> so despite the fact that that procedure has a lot of advantages, it takes a lot of the information that made the original document so interesting away from the, 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 uh, the computational version that we have. Now, of course, there is a link between the two because they have to, are about the same text, so if you just look up the original text, you get uh, your thing back. Except that if you look at the historical documents, for instance, in this particular uh, uh, project that it comes from, then there always are errors. So you start correcting errors. You start uh, making orthographic corrections, uh, and you have to make them in two corpora at the same time because the, the two are not linked, except for with the text. And very often you make the correction on one side and not on the other. 
So almost always, if you have these kind of the, the documents, and we have uh, a TI original and then uh, an NLP version of it as well, the two are no longer matchable. If you want to match them, there's actually a lot of manual work. You have to say, this word is probably this one. Can you confirm that? Because there's basically no automatic ma method anymore in which you can map these two versions. <coughs> So we have a corpus that is searchable, but we no longer have the original that we're so interested in. So that's not a particularly good way of doing things, at least not in my view. So TikTok tries to do it very differently. It is the following. This is the original TEI document that we had of the one page. And let's actually focus on just the first three lines because we're not interested here in the entire page. So let's just do the first three lines. So we have a page break here, a line break there, uh, an expansion here, some codes. There could be loads more codes in here, but this is a, particular, a relatively simple, uh, uh, ah, there's a deleted word here by uh, a particular scribe. So it wasn't just, uh, deleted by the author himself, but by somebody later. <coughs> so all the information is there. And it's vitally important that we keep all that information. So we're not going to touch any of that. What we're rather going to do is something very simple. We're going to add extra XML nodes around all the words in a document, directly in this DEI document. Not only if it's a simple word, but also if there's XML code, we just put uh, uh, an indication around it that this is a token in our text. This is still not something that we can uh, use in uh, computational processing. So in those kind of cases, we need to actually tell the computer what it's going to have to use as the string representation of this token. So we, we have a string representation for all the tokens in our corpus. <coughs> in this case, it's typically just uh, um, the word without any of the XML code. In this case, we chose to not do the uh, expansions inside the form, but that, that's uh, uh, a different issue. Uh, if the word is deleted, you, uh, you make it empty, the, the actual text representation. <coughs> so there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on there. Uh, there can be line breaks inside tokens. You can have all sorts of XML codes inside tokens, but you can never have uh, XML codes inside your string representation here. Implicitly, all these things have a string representation, except that it doesn't really make a lot of sense to add it here because it's the same as the internal uh, value of the, of the node. So whenever this is the same as what you would put here, you don't put it because it's redundant. <coughs> so that's the whole idea behind TATOC, basically. <coughs> And once you have this, you have basically a, stri a string of string representations of words, which is what you would have in uh, <coughs> an NLP version of a corpus as well, except that they're now inside an XML document, except for uh, 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 instead of uh, one line uh, per document, uh, per one word per line, as you have in an NLP document. But we can, of course, happily verticalize this. We can just put everything on a line. And this is actually a screenshot from the same document uh, where you have each word on a line, each, number, each word has an ID, and then you can just start adding uh, columns. Notice that we never touch this column, but we can add a standardization. Uh, so we normalize the text, but not in CTU, we just add an extra attribute that is a normalized form, so that we can actually do our NLP representations better. <coughs> so rather than touching the, the TEI document, we keep the doc TEI document exactly as it is, we don't do anything, we just add information, right? <coughs> And now we all of a sudden have a traditional NLP type corpus. Uh, if you would have a dependency parser, you'd also have uh, uh, dependency relations, had uh, uh, all sorts of other things that you could have. You could add uh, EPUB transcriptions if you have a spoken corpus. <coughs> you can just have uh, columns. Of course, this isn't really the whole story because there's a lot more information here and all of that has to go into the same document as well. So the actual, the, uh, the actual XML behind the, the, the pages you saw there, these first three lines, is, oh, uh, once we have, sorry, <laughs> that, uh, this is in between. Here you actually have a display of that text. Uh, so this is simply the text, but then displayed as is. It's white space sensitive, so rather than what you have in typical NLP corpora, if there is no uh, space between a dot and a word, th there's no space in it here as well either, because uh, there are no spaces there. Spaces are important. <coughs> um, and if we hover a word over, a, over a, hover the mouse over a specific word, we get all the information that we have about it, right? The part of speech tag, the lemma. Uh, in this case, it also keeps track of where the PBS actually came from. 
in order to produce this, we get the image on the right hand side, so you can immediately see if there's any weird things uh, going on there. You can immediately check this source document. <coughs> but of course, the, the actual XML code behind this is not uh, this small bit that you saw here, it's actually this, right? <coughs> so the idea is still the same, except that what you get is unmanageable XML. This is no longer XML that you can write by hand. It's, you can write the, in, the input DEI by hand, but once you get to this stage, you can no longer work with this by hand. I mean, theoretically, you can look things up and correct things if the system doesn't allow you, but if you want to work with this, which has all sorts of advantages, you need a graphical user interface to do that. And that's basically what TATOC is. TATOC is a graphical user interface that allows you to do this kind of NLP directly in a DEI document. So all the documents are TEI in their base, and then all the linguistic information is just added as additional layers of annotation on top of the original document. If you take the annotation layers away, you end up with what you put in. Except that, of course, in the meantime, you can also edit things. Uh, you can actually make doc documents directly in TEI uh, talk, so you don't necessarily have the TEI as your input. There's other ways of making these as well. <coughs> so TEI is a web-based graphical user interface. Uh, to have a, a corpus consisting of these files, to visualize them, as we saw before, uh, to create them and edit them, which is typically not what you do in, in corpus linguistics. Once you get to the corpus linguistics, the things have to be stable. But in, in historical documents, that's very often not the case. You always uh, run across errors in the transcription. So at any point, you have to say this word, which we transcribed as such, actually are two words and they're completely different. We misread them, and we now want to edit them. <coughs> And you have to still be able to do that once you get to this point, right? So that, that's what Tatoq allows you to do. At any point in the, in, the, in the stream, you can always edit all your XML documents. <coughs> and then you can also search. But search, in a sense, is an additional thing on top of all this. So where, um, uh, where the tools like uh, Corpuscle or Black Lab or Context are about searching through these verticalized documents, in Tatoq, that is more or less an additional layer that you can also do. But the, the actual base purpose of Tatoq is more to display and edit and create those documents and get information from them. <coughs> it's a general purpose tool. It was created at the same time for a historical document and for a learner corpus. And since these are very different in nature, it can be used for virtually any other kind of uh, document as well. Um, Despite the fact that the files get much larger, so if you have a, an NLP document, your files are small. In the, C, the XML version, your files are much bigger. But nowadays, that's really not a, a problem anymore. Unless you have a gigawatt corpus, which isn't really particularly meant for this kind of tool anyway, because you're not going to edit each document in a gigawatt corpus. These are meant for small little corpora where each document matters, in a sense. And then you never get to a gigawatt corpus. You have a, a couple of million words max. And a couple, even 30 million words still fits on a pen drive nowadays. And a pen drive is two euros. So the fact that these documents are much larger than they used to be, used to be a problem back in the days. Nowadays, it's no longer an issue. <coughs> but you do get a document in which the same document serves the philological purpose and the NLP purpose at the same time. You don't have different corpora. You have one corpus which uh, serves these both needs at the same time. <coughs> and... Um, a big advantage of this kind of representation over, say, CONNEL, which is a verticalized uh, 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 format with loads of uh, columns, is that in those kind of formats you have a fixed number of columns. Each column has to be filled. So if you have no dependency relations, you have to un have underscores there to indicate that these are empty. In XML, that's not a problem. You can have attributes or you cannot have them. If you add new attributes, nothing changes. This, uh, everything keeps on working. In that sense, XML is flexible. You can add information without any of the tools in, the, in your pipeline uh, breaking, right? <coughs> so the idea behind Tidak is actually very, very simple. Once you actually start going in there, then of course uh, loads of things have to be done and it grows out of hand. But the, the very fact that, until now at least, all the things that we wanted to do with TED Talk were, capable, were possible to do with this basic format uh, are a, a very good strong point in favor of the, the tool itself. <coughs> This is a GUI. It's important that it's actually being used. Uh, if you have these kind of graphical user interfaces, then the position of a button can make the efficiency radically different. 
So if people are not using it, then these kind of tools don't work. Fortunately, there's about uh, 42 and growing. I think there are 50 already in the meantime. <coughs> Different tools around uh, uh, corporate around the world that, that use the uh, So there's a, a, a relatively strong base of, of users that give feedback and can tell you uh, what is working and what isn't working. So there's uh, <coughs> specific aspects of TED Talk that nobody has used, and those typically are not particularly reliable, because unless they actually uh, are being used, they are theoretically working, but you don't know if they actually do what you meant them to do. <coughs> uh, there's a user community, but that's, you need those, but that, that, that doesn't really work very well with this small number. You need thousands of people to actually get to a, a Google community that would actually solve problems for you. <coughs> These are the current projects that we have. So there are 14 historical corpora, 9 learner corpora, 9 spoken corpora, 4 reference corpora, 2 dictionaries, which aren't actually corpora, but they should use the tool anyway. Um, uh, some less re resourced uh, corpora, which is because uh, the tool initially came for, uh, from a tool which was meant for less resourced languages. Um, <coughs> and the very idea behind this is that corpora nowadays are built by corpus linguists. But if you have a historical corpus, then the corpus linguist has no idea about all the ins and outs of, uh, of traditional uh, philolog philological trans uh, transcriptions. So they do things which don't necessarily make sense from the perspective of, a, of a historical linguistics. So it would be much better if the historical linguist could make their own corpora and be responsible for them. So Taitok is a GUI that is meant to be very usable, meaning that in principle uh, a historical linguist could be responsible for its own corpus without having to rely uh, for any kind of uh, correction on the corpus linguist. <coughs> And these ideas are always nice in principle, but it actually also works, surprisingly enough, in a sense. Uh, there are um, large YIS corpora which are being built by students. Uh, one of them actually here at uh, uh, the, phil the philosophy department. The Czech learner corpus is uh, currently being expanded with a, a bunch of text by uh, native speakers. And those transcriptions are done directly in Talk by students. So there's a, somebody supervising that, but the tool is actually intuitive enough so that students can work with it without too much problem. <coughs> so the base philosophy behind Taitok is take care of your own corpus. <coughs> that isn't just because it's useful, but also because it avoids errors. So if you always use an interface to make any corrections, then you can't accidentally put a tab character somewhere that breaks everything beyond it. <coughs> Or worse, if you use Excel for something uh, and somebody accidentally sorts a column, then your whole corpus is gone, basically. Those things, you think that it would never happen, but it always happens. If you look at the corpus that has been around for, for 30 years, basically we, we, we try to, uh, uh, there's a, 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 a Portuguese reference corpus, and we try to put it into Taitok, and then there were one or two errors. And then we discovered that basically everything that you could possibly imagine having gone wrong at some point actually did go wrong. So they have an external Excel sheet for the metadata that got lost. They changed the names of it. Uh, they uh, did had half the files were in the wrong text encoding. Uh, all these files that, that, that could in principle happen, if you have a corpus long enough, then all of them happen at some point. And to small parts of your corpus, you don't necessarily see them easily. But once you actually start using tools, you think, like, um, no, this is also wrong. Wait, this is also wrong. <coughs> so a, a GUI helps a lot because it doesn't allow you to do certain things, right? <coughs> so here are some screenshots of, uh, of the act. Oh, this is actually Chessel, uh, the Czech learner corpus. So here we have a, a text written by a student. Uh, he uh, wrote something, then deleted it and added a different word above the line. So you see that here. Um, and behind the screens is this heavy XML, right? But you never see that. If this word is wrong and you want to correct it, you just click on it. It opens a new window where you get the word in its context, so you see which word you're talking about, and you can just add uh, different types of information uh, inside here directly that uh, are pertinent for this corpus. Uh, notice that we have expos and upas here, so each corpus has to indicate which feature that it actually wants to keep track of. If you want to have part of speech tags, if you want to have dependency relations, you, before you actually set up the corpus, have to say what is important for your corpus. So this is simply filled in by things that you indicate that you want to have here. There's nothing default here. You can have whatever you... The only default is this. You always need an XML, and you always need this written form, which is a string representation without the XML. But those are the only obligatory fields. Anything else is up to you, in a sense. <coughs> 
Uh, and the same holds for metadata. So metadata and TEI documents are kept in the same XML file. And also those, you don't want to see the XML, you just want to have a, a small form in which you can actually fill in information. So all this is simply simple uh, graphical user interfaces tricks to man manipulate XML documents uh, easily. And the XML documents are huge, massive. <coughs> Since you can actually define what you want to have in your XML document, you can have multiple orthographic realizations of the same word. Think uh, the original form and its normalization. But it doesn't necessarily even have to be one normalization. <coughs> so, um, no, this is actually from a learner corpus. Uh, I'll, I'll show another one. So we can have di simply, we can define exactly which of all of these, uh, the normalization, the regularization, the target hypothesis, the modernization, the romanization, the diplomatic form, all of these are different notions. Largely similar, but all slightly different. And in your corpus, you might be interested in most, many, uh, various of them. So here's a screenshot of an actual uh, document in, uh, in Taitok. This is one of the oldest, uh, the oldest document in Portuguese. The Cantigas de Santa Maria. Um, actually in Gallego Portuguese, because it was before Portuguese and Gallego split apart. And this is the semi-paleographic transcription. But from that same document, using the fact that we can have multiple orthographic realizations for the same word, we can generate this as well, which is the diplomatic transcription. So this is slightly normalized, it no longer has long S's, it has normal S's, and it has expansions in gray. This is the normalized form in modern Portuguese, and this is the normalized form in modern Gallego. So all of these are different versions of the same text, not different documents, simply generated from the same underlying XML document. <coughs> so for historical linguistics, these are kind of things are very important because it gives you the place to put different versions of the text. Uh, um, if you actually uh, provide these tools to philologists, they uh, think, hey, what I'm going to do is this, and then you explain, and they think, so where am I going to put this? And then they actually want even more than they thought they needed before in the, in the first place. So all of these things are very important to actually describe the, the complex underlying nature of these uh, ancient documents. Because <coughs> some of the words are incorrect in modern uh, language or incorrect in the, the, the regional de version, but they are dialectically correct or used, so you want to keep track of that as well. So there's a lot of things that you want to keep track of. And given all these real realizations, you can actually do that. You can basically keep track of anything you want to keep track of. <coughs> <coughs> you can make that a bit more extreme. So this, I showed this uh, last week as well because it's such a beautiful document. Um, this is one of the very few texts in glacolithic scripts. Um, and there are very few people that can read this. But if you would not transcribe this in glacolithic, you take away basically everything that makes this document so interesting, right? So we want to have this in glacolithic scripts. Fortunately, Unicode happily uh, supports glacolithic script, so we can just describe it in glacolithic script. But then we also need different orthographic realizations of the same text to, from the same document, generate it either in Church Slavonic or in uh, Latin characters, and then all of a sudden most of the people here in the room will be able to read it, probably. <coughs> so this is an old Church, this is the, 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 the what do you call this, the Evangelii of Mark, uh, the Book of Mark. <coughs> In glacolithic script written in, I can't remember when. The Corpus Ographensis, it's called. It's one of the few, very uh, few and uh, most beautifully or ornamented uh, glacolithic um, uh, transcripts. So these kind of things you can also do in Titox. You can really just keep track of, we have a, for most things this will not be that relevant, but if you look at, um, there's a corpus of uh, Ladino, which is uh, uh, Judeo-Espanol, the, the language that the Jews spoke when they were kicked out of Spain in the 15th century. And it's still spoken today. Well, no longer really, because it was taken over by Hebrew recently. Uh, but until like 50 years ago, it was uh, used a lot. It's not a big language, so there's not a lot of documents. And furthermore, the documents are nowadays always in Latin script, because that's the offic official orthography. Originally, they were always in Hebrew. Uh, and since mo most of them moved to Turkey, uh, on the border with Russia, a lot of them are in uh, Greek script, in uh, Arab script, in uh, Cyrillic. So if you only can use one of those, then you can't really big, build a big corpus for these kind of languages. But if you can put all of them together and normalize them in the same way, then all of a sudden you can have a single corpus which contains all these documents in different scripts in their original version and still nevertheless be searchable in modern uh, uh, radio. <coughs> Thank you.
Now, as I said, one of the things you can do in the TED talk is actually search and do NLP analysis on these kind of documents. But in a sense, there's uh, an additional layer. You could theoretically search through these documents directly using something like XQuery. So you directly look in, uh, inside the XML files. And that's basically what Black Lab does, but it's, it has a lot of uh, drawbacks. It's difficult to do. You really need to depend on very heavy tools like Solar uh, built by uh, Apache to, uh, to be able to do that. So that's what they do in Black Lab. Um, but other than that, there is no way of searching uh, um, uh, well and fast through XML documents. So uh, that's why we need a language that is actually intuitive, like CQL. It's the most intuitive language for searching. That's why everybody implements it, including uh, Manatee. Um, it was originally developed by the uh, Corpus Workbench. Uh, and there's a small variation. So you basically have square brackets to indicate that you want a word. And they say what kind of word you want by just adding features on it. Uh, it's very intuitive. It takes five minutes to get your head around how it works. And then you really can just write these kind of documents. <coughs> So you want to be able to search through documents using that. And the only way to do that is actually use tools that do that. So what Titoc does is it uses the Corpus Workbench. Um, not actually the Corpus Workbench in a sense. Uh, it uses a lot of custom tools that use the same file format. So I'll get a, big, a bit back to that uh, in a bit. Um, and with that, and, and then it actually does a trick, which I'll explain in a second, is it doesn't give you a quick list, a keyword and contact list, it actually gives you XML fragments back. And I'll explain why that is important and how it does that. It does that by a tool called uh, TT, uh, the, CW, uh, the CWB encode. The actual encoder of the Corpus Workbench is called CWB encode, and that was what I initially started using. So you just verticalize your text and then use that, uh, the, the CWB, uh, CQP tool. The problem is, you also want to keep track of all sorts of XML tools. You want to, to know that this was in bold, that this is a line, that this is a paragraph. And all the things are very difficult to get out of an XML document and put into a, a verticalized form. It's not impossible, but it very uh, quickly gets very hairy. <coughs> so rather than keeping uh, doing that, which at some point really stopped working well, I just wrote my own, which directly reaches, uh, reads the XML files, go through all the tokens directly, uh, <coughs> and then writes the, the CQP files directly from the XML files. And while doing so, it keeps track of the byte offset of each of, the X, uh, of each of the tokens that it finds. So it keeps track of where in the XML file the, the token starts and where the, the, in the XML file it stops. <coughs> because that makes it very easy to say, okay, give me those characters from the file, then you don't have to open it and do weird things with it. Uh, you can get those Im immediately from the file. Um, it's, it's the fastest way of uh, getting access to files. That, that's how most indexing works. <coughs> so on top of the normal files that CQP writes, it also writes these uh, byte offset files. <coughs> and then once it has done, gone through that, you can say, I want to have additional things like paragraphs or lines or God knows what. And what it does is it goes through those as well and then sees which tokens are underneath that and then associates it with those things. So it writes a range for that and it writes a byte, of, uh, byte offset for those, uh, those elements as well. And they can even do the same with external standoff annotation files, uh, which you sometimes need, despite the fact you can do a lot in, inside the XML itself, uh, with explicit uh, relations to the tokens that they belong to. <coughs> so it writes these XADX files, which are indexes for each P attribute and S attributes, which are positional attributes and structural attributes, so those are uh, tokens and uh, ranges of tokens, uh, and keeps the byte offset uh, for each of those. <coughs> And with that, if we search for a word that starts with Rus in our corpus, we get these two results. And we not only get the quick line, but we actually get the fact that this word was deleted. This word is not in our searchable corpus because it was deleted. Uh, and we see that this word was added. So we see the actual, and we can click on these words to directly edit them or uh, get more information on them. So th these are actual XML fragments with all the information below, behind them. So if you move your, your mouse over one of these, you see all the part of speech tags, information, and all the information that we have on them. <coughs> and you can even do uh, this, the various orthographies here. So if you do this for um, uh, the Ladino, Ladino corpus, I should have made a screenshot of that. So if you search in the modernized version of the Ladino corpus, and you then click on the transcription, you get things in Hebrew, you get things in Cyrillic, you get things in uh, uh, Greek, you get things in Latin, and all of them are just there, right? So you can switch with these buttons uh, to actually get different. No, let me not do that. That will hopelessly go wrong. <coughs> um, 
And sometimes this is very, very important to have XML fragments, because like I said, historical documents typically aren't easy. There's always issues with them. And here's a very clear indication of where things can go hopelessly wrong. In the 16th century, there's a, a phenomenon in Spanish called decaismo. So where before you said, um, I saw off that he was uh, drinking, you dropped the off. So initially you had an off there, and at some point that off simply got deleted. You say, I saw that he was drinking. Bef whereas before that you saw, I saw off that he was drinking, and that off gradually gets deleted. Um, since it's a de, de que, it's called de queismo. I first thought it was a weird term, it's simply de que and anismo. <coughs> And so people study when and where that started, because it, uh, whether it started all at once, or whether it was a region where it started and it spread. So there's a, there's a study about where that happened first, where that happens exactly. <coughs> and an historic corpus uh, like this can actually help you to, uh, to, to do that quickly, especially since this is a, um, a semi oral corpus, uh, you're much closer to the source. You actually, it, if people... Um, if a change like that happens, then scribes will avoid it for a while, whereas people that are just writing write whatever they think, right? <coughs> and here we have a case of mi mucho ignorancia que con tan notable efecto. So this is a, a case where they dropped the de. Except they then wrote the de before, above it. So independently of which way I choose to go, whether I include the de in my corpus or I exclude it, both of them are wrong because it's there and it's not there at the same time. Obviously, she first wrote it and then she said, oh shit, there was supposed to be a de here. <coughs> So, in a TEI representation, we have the fact that this is actually added. You see it above the line here, right? Whereas, if I make a normal NLP corpus out of this, that information is gone. But since we actually get XML fragments as our results for, uh, for, resu uh, for queries, if we look for all the dust that are followed by Q, and, uh, uh, and then uh, nouns of ansia before that, that in this quick list here, I immediately see that there is one here, but this is actually one that was added above the line. So this one I have to be careful with. I can't just use this one, right? So I can't all of a sudden say, but well, no, but obviously it was also used in, in uh, Saragossa at the time already, because look, I have an example here. Like, no, but that example isn't the real example, right? <coughs> so these kind of ca cases, you can always look at the context, but here you're in the XML representation and get a lot more visual feedback of these kind of things immediately. You also see whether the kind of things that you're looking at weren't actually semi-unreadable. It's a guess of somebody, because those things also happen a lot. <coughs> so you get a lot more feedback directly from the original documents, and you can quickly look it up. If you look at the context, you also see the image, and you can actually go to the image immediately. So this is why it's so vitally important for this kind of historic documents to keep track of all the TEI that was in the original document. And this is just one example, there's a, there's a lot more. There's one thing that you might notice here. There's words in pink here that aren't actually importantia de, it's importantia douche. This is a contraction of de and us. It's the, the of and the, in plural, together. These are very frequent in uh, del in Spanish. This is Portuguese. These are very frequent in, uh, in Romance languages. And in uh, uh, NLP corpora, which is typically about grammar, you typically split them into de and el. So it means that any corpus qu qu concordance that you get from example, for teachers, they always contain de and el separated. Which if you show it to kids, they look at it like, what? <coughs> so uh, that's why people did a lot of uh, attempts to make that not happen. They want to have the corpus example actually be the, the way they are written. But here you have a problem. We have one orthographic word, but two grammatical words. So Tedek uses a trick to get around that. So those are the cases like the O in coq au vin, which is actually coq à le vin, or nains, which is actually non nais si, if I'm not mistaken, because I don't speak Czech. So. <coughs> You need to split them, because otherwise you can't add uh, pos and, uh, the part of speech tag and the lemma, because they don't have a lemma. <coughs> but you want them to be kept together as well, because that's how they're written, and we want to keep the original document. So TEI uses an XML trick, which is actually adds grammatical words inside orthographic words. So there's nested tokenization. We have here the word names, which has three different grammatical words inside. But these are just XML annotation inside the word. So the original word is still there. We didn't touch it. We just say, well, actually, below that, we have three different grammatical words. And those are, respectively, a, pre a preposition, a pronoun, and an auxiliary verb. Right? So this is a trick to be able to keep the original transcription and still have grammatical words uh, for your searches. 
And despite the fact that Tetok is uh, uh, customizable, so you don't necessarily have to do that, these will be the thing that I exported, and this will be the thing that you see. So this is what you search, and this is what you see. <coughs> this gets hairy in some cases, uh, but, but it works. This is actually uh, the only trick we could come up with that actually allows you to combine orthographic and uh, uh, grammatical words at the same time. And this even works for, works for the infix that you have in Portuguese. So, um, if you have the, the, the future tense haverei and the declitic lu, you put it inside. So it's not haverei lu, it's haver lu -ay. So you, you can't really say which of these is first and which is comes second because they're at the same time. Uh, but you always say that the clitic comes after, but you can just represent it. You have the clitic in the middle here, and then you say we have two grammatical words, and you just write them the way they would be written if they were uh, separated. <coughs> How much time do you have? So from this very simple idea, uh, Tetok started expanding. And we started to do different kinds of corpora and added, adding more and more features. And Tetok has an extremely modular setup, which means that every little extra feature that you build is just a very small, small little program that basically reads an XML file and does something with it. It displays them, it searches them, it modifies them. But all of these things are in principle independent, <coughs> which means that not only am I constantly adding new features, but uh, if uh, you use Tetok and you have something that you wanted to do and it doesn't do it, it's very easy to just write your own. So this is a, a hello world instructions for Tetok. Um, this, uh, you simply put something in, uh, in a variable and uh, the system will pick up on it. And there's a, a bunch of different things in which you can do this. Uh, this uh, would make use of a shell command called TEI to text, which would take TEI and produce text, presumably because there is no such tool, I think. Well, there are actually a few of them, but none of them are called like this, I think. And it will get uh, whatever file I indicated on the command in the URL that uh, we want to take. So this will give you a plain text representation of the document. It will say hello world first, and then it will give you the plain text representation of the document. <coughs> This is an excellent example of something that uh, was custom built. Uh, this was built for the, the, chess, uh, um, the Czech learner corpus, in which they have a representation in which they have the original text uh, aligned with uh, a fully normalized uh, representation. Um, and there are specific files that I needed to uh, get my head around because we needed to do something with them. I had no idea what they were supposed to do, so I just wrote this little module that actually displays it so that I can actually see what it does. So this is, um, on the top you see the actual XML fragment, here you see the corresponding fragment in the, the feed files, which are the files that they use, and these are the other two layers of that same feed file. So this is a, uh, a very specific thing that only works for the Chessel corpus, because that's the only uh, corpus that ever used this format. So this is a very specific way which you can show, and this I wrote in like half an hour or so. So it's, it's very easy to, to expand and make it do new things. Which also means that it's very easy to add new functionalities, and that's where it gets out of hand a bit. It, it, it does a lot of things, and I'll show some of them here now. Um, it of course can, you can do searches, like I said, that's not the main feature of Tytalk. It's, it's what people, most people will use the core prep for, but uh, um, for this it basically just uses CQP. It could use uh, other uh, uh, tools as well, so it would be very easy to write uh, an interface in the same way for Manatee. The actual interface of that is like 10 rows of, uh, uh, lines of code. And here you see the results of all the words that start with K, uh, distributed over um, part of speech tag. And it can give you actual uh, uh, um, uh, statistical data about the, the number of uh, results, uh, the total results, uh, the minimum and the maximum, the medium, the standard deviation, and God knows what. <coughs> and it, give, it can give uh, nice little uh, graphical uh, representations of all this using the, uh, the Google visualization tools. Um, so here you have a pie chart, a, a donut chart with uh, legends, uh, uh, a bar chart, what have you. So all of these can be generated directly from the, from the search results. <coughs> But then there are more specific things. So these are the kind of things that most of the um, uh, corpus tools will do, because this is what uh, the main uh, lo workload of the, the most of the corpus en uh, the search engines is. So this is not that different from, say, Context or CQP Web or uh, Corpus School or Black Lab. But most of the other things are, because it's a very different philosophy of doing these kind of things. So we can actually, if my most uh, uh, well, traditionally, nowadays, not so more, m much anymore. Uh, many of the text sets are uh, position-based. 
And they're usually not fully position based because the first letter indicates it's an adjective. And depending on the first letter, the rest of the letters uh, mean something as well. So if you search something in the corpus, you have to know that AQ0, MS00 means a qualitative adjective in the masculine singular non-diminutive. And if, if you don't have the manual, that's not particularly useful, right? So the people that built the corpus probably know those codes by heart, but nobody else will. <coughs> so you can have a structured representation of your corpus. You just tell it literally which positions you have and what all the positions mean. And then you can use that not only to check whether all the words in your corpus actually adhere to that standard, if there are no letters uh, somewhere that shouldn't be there, uh, it will give you a warning, like this is not used, that shouldn't be there. <coughs> because if you type in things, then you always will mix up a zero and an O or something, right? <coughs> so it will tell you this, there's an O here, there shouldn't be an O in this position. And it actually uses that, you saw it before already, but you probably didn't notice. It says MFP00PF, but it also tells you that it's a verb, a main verb, a participle, a plural, and a feminine. So it on the fly uses the description of the text that to actually give you uh, meaningful feedback. So that you don't have to know this code by heart, you can just read whatever it means. Of course, these are not totally descriptive either because it doesn't tell you that it's the feminine of the part, part of all it does, but you have to sort of figure that out yourself. But that is not a problem for uh, most of the cases. It does get a bit problematic if you use uh, um, uh, possessive pronouns, which have two types of gender, namely the ge gender of the possessor and the gender of the, ob the object. So you get female, uh, feminine and masculine next to each other, and it doesn't tell you which is the feminine and which is the masculine. But then again, most native speakers won't have a problem with that anyway, right? <coughs> and in the search, it will actually tell you that one of the is the possessor and the other is the blah. So you get a nice little search interface in which you can actually just select things by position. You don't have to type in these things. So it, it tries to help you use the corpus and interpret the corpus. It always in, interprets the user to not know anything and make it as... Uh, so it basically wants the corpus to be usable by high school teachers or something, right? <coughs> Which most corpora are not. It can do um, nice little fancy things. This is the same uh, transcription that we saw before of the Castiga de Santa Maria, but here we actually have a line of the transcription with a line of the manuscript above it. So you can actually intersperse this so you can directly see uh, the, the transcription below it. Which is not only nice and beautiful, it's also very helpful in the correcting the errors because once you see it this close together, you spot like, wait a minute, it doesn't say Leon, it says Leon, right? Uh, if there would be an error in this transcription, you would spot it here immediately. Whereas if you just have a, a page on the one side and your transcription on the other, there's no way you will ever spot that, especially not if the errors are small. <coughs> uh, if you use an OCR tool or a handwritten text recognition tool, you can even go further and say, give me all the bits of uh, facsimile image that, that are for the word Rila, uh, which is night in, uh, in Dutch. So this is a middle, an old Dutch uh, uh, text, and he actually, if you want to see how people wrote the word uh, night in, uh, in, the, in old Dutch, then you can just use this tool to actually find the thing. For this, of course, you need a line by a word by word alignment. You just don't need it just line by line, you also need a word by word. <coughs> so you can do it by hand in principle, but if you don't start with uh, um, uh, OCR tools or something like that, then it's very difficult or hard work to get that information in there. Uh, this is a critical apparatus. I'll not get into that also because it's not actually finished. Um, since it's XML, and XML also does, uh, TIXML also does uh, um, uh, uh, spoken data, you can have spoken representations in the same corpus as well. <coughs> This is actually from the same learner corpus as you saw before. No, we didn't see that corpus before, we only saw the check one. So this is a corpus that in part consists of uh, transcribed text uh, written by uh, people, and in part transcribed audio by the same students. Those are from the same students, so they should be kept together. But the, the, the needs for the oral corpus and for the, the written corpus are very different. If you don't have pauses in, in oral corpora, you lose a little of information. If you kick out the ahs and the hoons, then the, your oral corpus loses a lot of information. So from the same perspective, you get all your uh, information in your TEI document that you want, and then you just process it in the same way. You normalize it in the same way, and it gets searchable in the same way. So in, this, in your uh, quick lines, you can get mixed results from oral and, and, and written text, <coughs> and the two actual underlying TEI representations are very different. But the search results are the same. <coughs> um, if you have an oral-only corpus, you can search for something and then directly listen to the, f the results that you have. So it's a very quick way of actually finding uh, uh, spoken results. Then nowadays, there are more tools that are um, 
doing that. Uh, Esmeralda now has an interface which you can also sort of do that. But when we wrote this back in, because um, this is actually a, a modernized version of something I wrote in Lisbon in 2006, I think. And back then there was no other tool that did this, and uh, it still is, I think, in a sense, superior to the other ones, because this actually has part of sheet stack and uh, um, uh, other information in there as well. And uh, none of the spoken versions will have uh, part of speech stack information for you. <coughs> so if you move your mouse over here, you get part of speech text, and you can have dependency grammars in here as well. And you can even take it a step further and actually have uh, um, a representation in which you have the waveform around and then the, the thing before. This scrolls left to right and this scrolls up to the bottom to top at the same time, so they keep aligned. <coughs> um, if you keep track of, especially in the dialectal corpus or, or in an old uh, written corpus, which is semi-oral, or in an other corpus, where dialect is an important feature, you, it's, it makes sense to keep track of the geo-coordinates of where all your documents come from. And once you do that, you can actually map them on the, on the world. So these are all the data from the medicine corpus, I think, the mapa dialectal sonoro, the, 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 the oral dialectal map uh, for Portuguese. And once you have this information, since behind this you have a lot of uh, data about uh, part of speech tag and actual transcriptions, you can actually do searches on the map as well. Uh, context this as well, I saw. Uh, but here you get nice little uh, 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 donut charts that indicate that here we mostly, so here we comparing the word mulher and the word mujer. One is Portuguese and the other is Spanish. It's not that different. Uh, strange that there's a, a dialectal variation. But you see that in France, it's a bit half-half. There is obviously somebody writing uh, either Spanish or simply using the Spanish form uh, here, and there's uh, a Portuguese spelling there. But for the rest, you actually uh, happily see that this is Spain and this is Portugal. So if you do the same thing by something that isn't actually a different language, you get dialectical features of, uh, of words directly on the map. <coughs> These are not the only points. If you zoom in further, you get more points. It groups them. <coughs> You can also do dependency relations, so this is inside the same uh, XML document again. So here we have the XML fragment, and then below it we have a, a tree the, the representation of the dependency relations. Um, there's a bunch of things to be said about that. <coughs> you can actually run the, the um, um, what's it called again? UD pipe directly on any, uh, so uh, any language that is in UD pipe you can run directly from uh, a talk. If you have your text split in sentences and it isn't part of the dependency parsed, you can run the UD pipe on it uh, directly. <coughs> the fact that it happens to be from here is purely accidental. I did it long before I came here. Um, and then you can uh, do it like this. There's even a search language with which you can exploit this. It's not uh, a dedicated uh, search. It's actually a modified version of uh, CQL rather than a, uh, a dependency parser. <coughs> and you can also do dep the more traditional dependency things. These are done standoff. These are not done inside the corpus. So this is slightly less well fitted for something like Titalk. You can't really do this in a sense. Whereas dependency relations, you can really just embed the, the way. So what it, the, how I showed that um, part of speech text and lemma work, the dependency relations work in exactly the same way, just like it does in, in common representations. This, on the other hand, has to be an external uh, standard annotation file, because you can't do this in, inside XML. But it works nevertheless, because they're nicely. As you can see here, we get information about this word, which is actually part of this word. So here we once again get the information that this is a clitic. <coughs> so as you can see, there's a lot of different modules, and these are, uh, then there's, uh, ah, in the, uh, you can do morphological analysis of text, if, uh, since, like I said, uh, initially it started with less resource languages, for less resource languages you very often don't know the morphology, so you actually do need to do morphological uh, decomposition. And then there is um, all sorts of other modules as well that I'm not going to show you. What I did want, do want to do is um, um, uh, get to one more uh, technical point because we need to stop now. Right? <coughs> so, um, apart from the fact that from the philological point, this makes a lot of sense, right? We now have a tool in which we can search in a historical corpus using modern, uh, modernized versions and using part of speech text and immediately get XML fragments with a lot of uh, uh, typographic information in there. And we can go to the context, we can see the image next to it, we can do a lot of things. 
But also from the perspective of the computational part, there's a lot of advantages to the fact that you have one XML document that contains a lot of different types of information inside. So you have all these different orthographic realizations of the same form. Um, so this could, for instance, be a, a word of my corpus. It isn't, but... Uh, so we have uh, a word where somebody wrote they all, and then probably a U, but we're not certain. And then he wrote a, d a W and then deleted it, right? Uh, <coughs> we interpreted this DO, the W we don't uh, transcribe because he ended up not writing it. We normalize it as DO. Uh, and in that case, it would be a, a, a common noun uh, with potentially a dependency relation, a head, and what kind of other information you would have. <coughs> and this would be in my corpus. But there would be other cases of DO in my corpus as well. Um, and those you can actually use in NLP tasks. So uh, the, the, my own part of speech tagger that I wrote uh, uh, long before the TED talk, uh, actually by now directly works with XML. So it trains on XML, it uses XML parameter files, and th those store all those kinds of different orthographic realizations. And that you can use to do a trick that you otherwise would basically be incapable of doing, you can do in-context in context normalization using part of speech text. Because if you have this word do, and he put the do in the oven, that's clearly that it should be uh, normalized, the, the do with a gh behind it. But if you would have the sentence, I'd like you to do it, then you wouldn't normally normalize it like that. So if you have both examples in your corpus, some of the do's are actually do's and some of the do's are actually do's, then you can use the fact that this would be a verb and this would be a noun to disambiguate them after you actually, uh, so you put both hypotheses out there. So it could either be this normalization form with this part of speech tag, or it could be this one with this part of speech tag. And then you just use your part of speech tag <coughs> uh, statistics to figure out in this context which of those is the most no uh, uh, natural one, right? Which normally you couldn't do. If you first do the normalization, you have to first decide. If you first do part of speech tagging, you have to first assume which of those it is already. But if you actually do it during the part of speech tagging, which you can do because all that information is together, you can actually use the context to use statistics to figure out which of those two normalizations would be the correct one. And you can do that for all sorts of other things as well. The more information you have together, the more you can exploit to improve your, your part of speech tagging, your dependency relations, your what have you. And I think... Well, uh, like I said, uh, it's uh, about editing, so there's a lot of things about uh, 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 efficient editing, but um, I think I'll skip that because we need to stop now. Right? <laughs> we'll have to have a kind of a technical, technical break before... We have actually a lot of time for discussion, but um, we need kind of a 15-minute technical break somewhere in between. So we thought we would do it between Martin's talk and discussion, so that we have all the time that we want for discussion. Uh, but we can do the break slightly later. Jan Hajic actually has to come here for something. Ah, okay, sorry. <coughs> um, so let me, let me just show this one, uh, because like I said, uh, editing is an important feature in, in, uh, in Tay Talk. Uh, it actually assumes that you're Contrary from, from traditional NLP uh, corpus tools, uh, Tytalk assumes that your corpus isn't finished yet. You're still working on it. You made errors. You, one of the things that always bugged me is you have a, a corpus tool, you build your own corpus, you use it, you put all your information in there, you are searching it yourself because if you're doing it well then you're your own uh, corpus biggest user because otherwise you should have built a different type of corpus. Uh, so you, you run across errors that you made. If, and then you can't just open it and correct the error. You would have to go back to the text file, then run through all the NLP pipelines so that you can finally get to the result again. That's not particularly efficient. And especially not if you're not an NLP person, right? So that means that corpora never get cleaned up, despite the fact that smaller corpora can basically be manually cleaned up. So over time, they can just improve. There are problems that part of speech tags very often are ambiguous, but that's a very different kind of problem. So whether um, boiled is a, an adjective or a, a participle, that is something that is an understandable error. But if it made boiled a conjunction for some weird reason, then that is not acceptable. So if you get those kind of errors out, that definitely helps uh, uh, in a lot of senses. 
It doesn't make your accuracy necessarily better because you still get the other types of error, which from an NLP perspective are just as bad, but from a linguistic perspective they're not. If you have a dough that is a, a conjunction, uh, if you have a boil that is a conjunction, people say this is a very bad corpus. If you have a boil that actually was an adjective, people say, wow, okay, that's debatable. Right? <coughs> so the idea is that if you're using your corpus and you see one, you should just be able to click on it and correct it. And in TikTok you can. Um, it's actually very uh, efficient for normalizing text. So you have your normalized text and you miss one. So you see the text in its normal normalized orthography. As a native speaker, you, you, you spot the incorrect words immediately. And then you just click on it and correct it. So in that sense, it's very efficient. Because you, the same interface that the visitors use, you also use to edit. So if you're logged in, you can just click and correct. If you're not logged in, you cannot correct, of course. <coughs> Um, so in that sense, it's a, it's a very efficient editing method. So little by little, the more errors you encounter, the more you can correct, right? So in that sense, it's, it's a very efficient. It's a way that allows you to gradually clean up your corpus. But if you just made it and you just use NLP tools that make errors, that is not particularly efficient. So there's at least two uh, ways in which you can do that better. <coughs> so the first is a screenshot we saw before already, except that now we have it editable. So we can say, for my corpus, I want to see my transcription and my normalized orthography, and I want to be able to edit, for all those words, the part of speech tag, the, uh, the UD post tag, and the lemma. So you get all of them below each other, and you just can, in a, a tabular form, but then in an the HTML form, just correct the ones that are wrong. So here it's very easy to see which are wrong, and you just correct them. right? So this is already much more efficient. So you just go through an entire uh, part of speech state corpus and just correct it. You can ask the students to like, correct this here. You don't have to actually make sure that they don't use ta tabs or God knows what because it's an HTML form, so you can't put things in the wrong column easily. <coughs> so in that sense, you're guided. It's less easy to make that kind of errors here. Uh, you can, of course, use punct with an O instead of with a C. Those, um, uh, uh, of course, happen. You can't really avoid that. For that, you have the, 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 the tools that I mentioned before, which you can actually check whether the, the part of speech text that you use corresponds to the part of speech text that you described. <coughs> so for a text that you just did, this is very efficient. So this is actually used a lot. I never use it myself, but uh, um, um, a lot of people ask students to go, go through this and simply correct all the part of speech text errors. <coughs> So for a first draft, that gets a lot of the errors out. After that, there will still be other errors, and those you can clean up uh, uh, more gradually. But there's one tool that actually uh, I'm particularly pleased with, which is combining CQP searches and, and corrections. So here, <coughs> we look for the word casa, which is house in um, Portuguese. I didn't say that it was, had to be Portuguese, so I get both Portuguese and Spanish here. This is a mixed corpus, so you always have to be careful. <coughs> And for some reason, I noticed that um, it made all of them into uh, 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 verb forms of the verb casar, to marry. Uh, which is correct, except that that's way less frequent than this one. So if all of them ended up being casar, the 95% or 99% of them will be incorrect. All of them should have been casa, uh, house. <coughs> so I can just look for casa through my entire corpus and say make all of them Part of speech tag, noun, uh, feminine, singular, and lemma casa, and this one, 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 and this one. If you do encounter a casa here, then you can just skip it and say, don't do that one. Then you click on uh, edit, and it will go through the entire cor corpus, open the XML files, correct, uh, put the correct uh, correction in there. <coughs> and uh, so this is a very efficient way of uh, correcting things. Of course, very often this will happen, but you do want to see them one by one, because in some cases it is one ca thing and in other cases it's the other thing. It also is the, often the case that uh, all the words that end on zation have gone wrong, but it's of course not always the same lemma, it depends on which verb it came from. It's, it's a wrong verbalization uh, uh, kind of thing. Uh, so you can also search for it and then say, well, I want to correct the part of speech tag and the lemma for all the results of casa in my corpus. And this doesn't have to be casa, it can also be all the conjunctions that are in between a noun and a verb in the third person singular, because those will al always be something else, right? So you say, there, there's a, I spot a problem, it's probably generalizable over my whole corpus, I just find what pattern uh, describes that problem, I uh, write a CQP search that finds them all, and then I just go through the, that particular list and, uh, 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 one by one. So you see the context, 
and you can directly for this one in the middle correct uh, the things that are likely to go wrong. So this is a very efficient way of structurally getting uh, rid of uh, uh, information uh, of uh, errors in your corpus. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, we can do some questions now and do some more questions when the Jan shows up. So thank you very much. Um, so I think that now you can probably see why we find the TATOC uh, interesting um, because it fulfills many uh, use cases that, that we currently cannot really serve very well with our corpus management tools because those were developed mostly for lexicography and it kind of shows, uh, at least on context. Uh, you can see what features are really well represented there specifically about filtering concordances uh, and, and finding collocations and things like that, and which features are completely missing, like displaying a document, actually seeing the whole article and being able to read it, including all the features that were originally there, if it's newspaper. When you mentioned the large corpora, I'm not, I'm not even sure that, that they wouldn't uh, benefit from these features. Currently, our gigawatt corpora are just plain text, but that is also influenced, it's a little bit of chicken and egg. When we harvest gigawatt corpus from web, we strip all the information because we know we cannot represent it anyway very efficiently. We cannot display it very nicely, so we don't calculate with that type of use case. I, I mentioned that last time. So I, I, um, the biggest corpus in Taito is a corpus that I built myself. It's a web harvested corpus. And it consists, it's a multilingual corpus uh, with the idea that we uh, have a lot of NLP tools for a handful of languages, but we don't have things for a lot of languages. So what uh, um, I have several attempts to, to remedy that, to, to make corpora for, for all those corpora that you're missing. Uh, but for many, cor for many languages, there's really nothing uh, that you can get your hands on. You would really have to ask people uh, to do that for you or something. Uh, but there's a, a largest class of, of languages for which you can get things. I mean, all those languages have online newspapers. So I built a web crawler that uh, crawls uh, newspapers from, uh, from the web. It does uh, 170 different newspapers on a daily basis in 130 different languages, and it keeps all the italics and the headers and the god knows what. So that that is, and that word is by now uh, 600 mega words, words or something. So that's not a problem. But then it starts um, taking a terabyte of information, right? Then then the, the disk space becomes sort of an issue. Depends a bit on your infrastructure, but uh, for my mine is at home because I, I build it at, uh, at home. So there uh, the terabyte becomes uh, becomes sort of an issue, not really, but... Uh, <coughs> I can see the audience that we have kind of a broader spectrum of, uh, of, of guests who, some of us are linguists, some of us uh, are primarily <coughs> from, from different fields, and even in linguistics, some of us are his more historically inclined and so on. So uh, I assume you can all think about the use cases and whether something like this could fit your data and whether we would see some use. Uh, so uh, we can start discussion now, but I apologize in advance that when, when Jan arrives, uh, we'll have to have a short break uh, because Jan needs to talk to Martin before Jan leaves again. So <laughs> it's, uh, it will be a short interruption. Uh, so please, any questions? Who's going to start? Okay, and we have to circulate the microphone for the recording. Hello, uh, just one. Uh, just one uh, short practical question. Uh, you've shown how uh, you can keep the structural tags inside and you can display them. Can you use the CQP to also search in them? So say I want to use, I want to find all emendations that are, you know, in um, some form. So here, let me just show it in uh, an actual corpus. Uh, but this is not a corpus that is particularly well finished, so let me know, not use this one. Um, so like, like I said, uh, um, uh, Taito always tries to be helpful for users, so it has a, a graphical user interface to actually search. Uh, and here you can see uh, what you can do. You can have, uh, uh, here on the right you see uh, that you can restrict your search to all the, the documents. So this is a learner corpus, and you can say, I want only those written by people from uh, uh, the Basque country. Right? Uh, but that works just, uh, just the same as it does. Uh, so I want to have, so you can either just simply do this, and then it will give you a list of all the documents written by uh, people from the Basque Country. Or you can say, 
I want, oh, this is obviously a very small, sorry, I want all the Catalan people that wrote the word uh, um, um, tanga. No, I, hope, I hope they don't, didn't do that. This would be Catalan, so. Serai? Uh, uh, no, they also don't do that. Oh. Um, And you can see here, there's obviously, ah, the corp, there's something wrong with the indexation. I know what happened. So this corpus isn't searchable right now because I did something this morning to improve it. And you see here that the, the CQL format allows you to say, to specify that you will only want the, the matches that are, come from text that are from somebody from Catalonia. But isn't that metadata? Doesn't, well, but what if you have <coughs> like structural tags, you know, like you, you, you've shown that you can, uh, you can tag emendations like things that were uh, that are expanded abbreviations, for example, in historical texts. So, if I want to search only those abbreviated, this is all metadata. It's a, a bit uh, dispersed. All these are metadata, but this is not. These are actually sentences uh, because um, it, so this is semi-oral, and the opening sentences are typically not. They're um, 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 uh, the traditional phrases semi-Latin or something, uh, they mark those. So they either say that it's the narrative or that it's the opener or the closer. So here you can say, I want to have uh, the narration things uh, of casa. And there you see that just like you have uh, matches in, from text that are written by the things, these are matches that come from sentences that are of the type narration. Right. So regions can be text, but they can also be uh, other types. So, so by the same way, if you have, a, say, your web crawler, <coughs> if you want to look up all the things that are in italics, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Okay. So you would have to just so to say you would have to first specify what of your core, of your XML you want to export, and then you say, well, the eyes are for me important, or the, the high rent is italics because that would be the TEI way of doing it. Uh, Title isn't actually TEI; it just is XML. It right. just re re recommends you to use the sure. I, but you could use I as well if you if you uh, uh, want to. And then you just say export I for me to my uh, to my uh, th thing, and then you say I want everything that is in italic. Okay, so you need to specify which of the structures okay. you and will then it just, uh, be able uh, to uh, export that as, okay. a, as, a, as a as a structural attribute as a region, and then you get uh, all your things that are in italic. Thank you. <coughs> and. As soon as possible. I would say 10 minutes or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can prepare your questions.